Welcome everybody to the Monday morning meeting. Uh, today is March the 6th. This is our fourth or so meeting. So let's go to uh, basically all these meetings. I want to give the perspective of what's going on in the project and then dive right into the development work. So overview on the development technique and where we are and then going right into what's happening. So first of all, team people. So uh, the team is uh, growing. So right now we have myself, Jonathan, Brian, Emmanuel, Rit Richard, Jean-Baptiste, and Jose Ura. Uh, so we're at five developers on the official OSC development team, the people who have made through the, the OSC FreeCAD test as part of the OSC developers. And for anyone who's watching this, go to the OSC developers page on the wiki, and you can see a little personal invitation there. Oh, I can't move my... Oh, there it is. <clears throat> OSC developers join the team. the The plan is to to keep growing the team in a in a much more de dedicated effort than we have ever done in in the history of the project. Idea being that um, as you see the the team growing uh, team growing here. Uh, imagine a velocity of say 12 teams of 12 pairs which is kind of what I'm thinking after one year of development so we can really really increase the development of what's going on in a project so this is the D3D meeting log here so if you want to see what's happening with the project itself so it's D3D is the official page for the distributed enterprise 3D printer at the top so so what are the some of the elements of the uh, the development platform here we're using the wiki first of all but the idea is Everybody has to know what's going on with the project. Uh, so we start the team page with the names of the people. Each person has a log. So you can click on Emmanuel's log, for example. You can see the files that he's been working on, like he up uploaded FreeCAD file right there, etc. So all the work is being tracked so everyone can collaborate. The big point being that we build upon each other's work. And then the common platform here is the D3D log for the meetings. If you click on a D3D log, we post the meetings here so you can review all the past meetings like right now we're recording this so that's gonna go up here on Monday March making sure I'm recording so I'm not talking to myself here yes I am um, so the March 6 meeting recording is gonna come here and that's gonna be published right after so we, we've recorded two meetings already you can see the progress on all that's going on to review the technical aspects and everything else so uh, on a D3D page, just to continue what's on the page itself, the way we work, because the idea is once we get a lot of people on board, it's one of the main challenges is going to be project collapse in terms of where is everything. If a lot of people are developing and working on multiple projects. So the, the way we do every project is for D3D, we break the project down into many modules. So here are all the links to all the different modules we're working on. So once again, this is at the main D3D page. You can go to all the parts because different people can work on different parts in parallel because we're designing this as module-based design. So that's that's the idea. Wait, and you guys are not seeing that. You guys should should scream. I, I'm meant to be sharing my screen here. So you can review this if you want to see that. Um, but so just to just to review that, this was the D3D page on the wiki. Uh, OSC invitation to developers. The statistics, we're seeing the team grow to five people. Now, we're also tracking the development hours, so this is good. There's a timesheet. If you go to the log, like any person's log, for example, Emmanuel, uh, you go to his log and there should be a link to a timesheet. Everyone should have a link to their timesheet to log their hours every week because we're tracking it, tracking what's happening in the project to get good data on everything that's going on. Now here, uh, you know, just you, if you observe the two graphs, the number of developers, so going from three to five uh, since last week, uh, congratulations to Jose and, and Jean-Baptiste, uh, but the hours here are going from about 30 to about 36. Now that's kind of fishy since we got two more people. Well, that means someone's not logging here. I actually looked at the log. Uh, only myself and Emmanuel have log their hours so everybody on the team please log your hours so we can see an encouraging uh, exponential spike here instead of that being linear please log your hours we want to track that so we can improve that so um, but continuing so 
on the project itself, the latest status is, let me uh, act, not share my screen, but let me share the actual physical product. So, so a lot of this is going as tag team between um, the different developers. So let me, let me show you what's, what's in this corner here, but this is, uh, this is where we're at right now. So the axes of the 3D printer, pretty much that's, that's what's going on here. 3D printing and prototyping of the frame. That's a CNC metal cut frame with magnetic attachments for all the axes. And, and let's go back to the, to the sh screen share. Uh, look at this. So this is the model. This is a manual once again. So we've got the full model in FreeCAD uh, Parts there's the axes and the frame at this point. We've got a lot of different individual files If you go to the d3d page um, A lot of the files are under d3d integration What we do in order to track where everything is if you click on a d3d integration meaning the whole project what we've done here is broken down the all the all the different there's like 13 modules here that we broke down the frame and the mechanical into so that people can work on that in parallel and as soon as something is completed a link is placed into one of these placeholders so uh, the idea being if you click on any of these these are these are hyperlinked so we can access the files and the way that you know that people so say I click on that I can go to this file and you see okay last update has been the February 25th so anyone is now able to download and collaborate if you see that the last work has been done on the 25th hey download it and um, work on it but as soon as you have anything upload it back so that there is no time delay between what happens uh, right now and the next person on a team taking um, continuing the development and you can think about this as once we get really good at this we can go into, I'm going to my log, to 24-7 to development around the world by tag teaming. So not only do we tag team within our team right now, um, let's see, let's look at the recent wiki changes. I, I posted, uh, this is actually on HR, I, I put this under the team building page, human resources. But here I put in, like, what could it look like down the road? Look at this, people. Um, <clears throat> can you see that? Yeah, you can. Uh, but basically, okay, so we're in OSC USA International here. Uh, here are, is G10, okay? <laughs> so uh, USA, China, J Japan, Germany, France, so forth. But think about w once we get good at this, we develop teams. So right now we're operating out of OSC USA with collaborators who are also in Europe. But once we get enough people on the team, we can go, you know, every, say, every six hour difference, we can have a new team pick up. And if we want to translate the the results from one team to the next there should be one person on a team who's like the the team connector the inter interface person who who participates in one meeting like this meeting right now and then participates to lead the next meeting so that full continuity happens with a full update of what's going on and so forth and everyone's uploading things to the wiki and we can continue that kind of development uh in a serious way so some of the etiquette required here one um, as soon as you have something uploaded, don't say to me, oh, I'm going to wait till I'm finished until I upload that. Uh, that's foul play in OSE rules because we want everybody to access the work immediately after it's done. So, it, so there's no lag as far as when the next person can take that work on. And the requirement there is if somebody downloads a file that's been just published, the assumption is as soon as any work is done, that file is going to be re-uploaded. Like, if you t take a look at this file, you can do an upload a new version of this file right there. So, this can continue. You can add notes as far as what's going on with that file itself. But the idea being no time delay between that. So, that's that's that. And another point of etiquette when we're communicating, once, of course, once the team starts growing, is um, email etiquette. When you're sharing updates, you know, you can update somebody on the team by email. We'd like to go through the OSC network, which is the network.opensourceecology.org as our official development platform. There's still some bugs on that platform, so we're not really releasing that to the public. But we have a 3D printer group on a network.opensourceecology.org, and we're communicating. So if you go to the groups here, uh, you go to the 3D printer group, uh, 3D printer development, and that's that's where we communicate. We can update what all is going on in the project here uh, it's basically our log with co comments this is our social network this is coming out soon not for public consumption yet we're working on some things here um, 
So when you're communicating the email etiquette, either publish a constant dialogue on the network that opensourceecology.org, or if you're emailing, don't email files back and forth because not everybody has access to them. Just send a link of a file that's already been uploaded to the wiki. So that's kind of the main main development principle. Go to the wiki as the universal development platform and upload everything there. Point people to there so that anything you point to is a public document. So once again, for the radical, um, radical openness and collaboration here, uh, make everything accessible as soon as that's available. None of this, uh, I mean, publish early and often is, the, is this open source software principle. Uh, don't wait because that time is potentially time lost that somebody else can be working on something if they're a team member and they understand the open open source platform altogether. So let's look at uh, the critical path here, what the, what the idea is for the 3D printer itself. The goals are ambitious. So right now we have a, a an April 22nd, so you can hardly see that here. Let me maybe get a little closer in here. But this is April 22nd is the workshop in Germany right now. The date is pretty firm right now. 3D printer workshop uh, for the Kickstarter backers from before, April 22nd, uh, Hamburg, Germany. We're gonna publicize that in about a week. So we're, we're gonna take some video and the machine working, etc. So there's some quick finishing and getting the electronics connected. But after that, we go, you see all these lines here. We want to do a regular workshop on the 3D printer every single month. So that is June, July, August, and so forth. Um, the, the concept there is we're encouraging everybody to develop the 3D printer with the idea that they can also run 3D printer workshops themselves once this thing is a good product, solid product. So uh, the idea there is we charge people a certain amount of money over the bill of materials cost for the experience, and that's a meaningful, viable model that people can make a living from. So we're looking at making a regular 3D printer workshop with OSC happen every month. If we get 24 people to show up to one of those events, if we're charging, we might be charging something like maybe $600 for the event. Um, maybe the bill of materials cost is like 300 and we might be charging like 300 for the experience, an extreme one day build experience. So if you have 24 people show up at $300, that's $7,200 per event. And that is the way currently we're thinking that we can get the stable cash flow into the operation. Because right now it's, um, the revenue for OSC has been very unstable. We do sporadic workshops. They're big and bold, uh, like the like the house build, but they're not regular. We need regular cash flow so that we can plan and plan on building the team and plan on putting more energy with a known budget that we have for operations. So that's the idea that the, the 3D printer would be our first regular, very very regular. Um, ongoing event followed by I think that's going to be the CEB press the brick press is going to be our second product and we'll see what else rolls out from there but those are the two products immediately that we're looking at running continuous workshop meaning like once once every month for the 3d printer and probably once every month for, for the brick press but maybe once every two months or so for the brick press since that at, at present that's a much bigger endeavor though once we streamline it definitely once a month and then down the road once a week and so forth until it, and to the point where it actually starts taking off and this actually is spreading virally. So uh, the big goal on the 3D printer front here is if you go to uh, December 2017 at the end of the year, we are planning on a grand 3D printer workshop. USA, Europe, probably China or Japan. But we're talking about now filling an auditorium of people building a 3D printer. So 100 3D printers in a single day. Let's think about that. Right now, the global production of 3D printers is 500,000. About it's a it's a it's about half a billion dollar market right now. Um, if we produce 100 in a single day, that is very significant. If that starts taking off, that that model itself of the social production, where people are, where these 3D printers are not not built in factories, so-called, or small operations, but as public events. That's the goal to show that this. This model of community-based production, the social learning experience, is a viable model for all kinds of products. That's a big deal. That could be the next economy. It's, it's a big concept because people are hungry to produce. If you produce it yourself, 
by def the big motivation there is by default that then becomes a pretty much a lifetime design product so say goodbye to planned obsolescence as when you build something you really control it because you can maintain it then for the rest of your life um, that you know especially like a 3d printer or something like a cordless drill if you build it yourself 3d printed and so forth you can replace parts and keep it lasting forever like like we point out cordless drills because we go through them like cotton candy here I mean they they last about a year or two around here and some as you know the cheap drills we get last like three months and then you throw them out so and to that and to like if you talk about three you know 3d printing and printing cordless drills right there uh, cordless drills are a billion dollar market you know imagine substituting that so this is open source product development and open source market substitution of throwaway goods with lifetime lifetime design uh, much more appropriate goods I mean just the just the uh, cordless drill right here I mean that's um, a billion dollar market right there so significant impact that can be had so in in general that's why we're excited about community-based production as a way to produce things where then people become the true masters of technology and technology in general becomes appropriate technology as, as opposed to throw away uh, kind of uh, crappy technology that doesn't help the world in general because it's polluting uh, it's throwaway it leads to consumerism and so forth so let's take the economy to the next level so that's a brief intro to to the way we work here module based design uh, all everything is published on the wiki and so forth so so let's get right into that, that's i think that's enough theory for now uh, so let's get right into the development work so maybe uh emmanuel can you update us where we are on the the frame so here's what what i have um, on the frame itself, I'm going to share my screen. So that's the that's the 3D printed 3D printed parts here. The full design in FreeCAD. Where are we? What what else is to be done there? Because right now at home, I'm I'm pretty much this has been built as is. The next step is to to run one of the axes. So the the x axis here is missing, but basically run a, run the system by connecting the electronics using ramps. Okay, go ahead. Okay, x-axis is uploaded, so we have to simply... Okay, so can you, would you mind speaking up a little bit? Yes, the, the x-axis is uploaded. It's, okay. It be ready. Excellent, uh, excellent. So we've got that as well. Um, what is your plan for the week? Is, do you have more to do on the, on the project in terms of integrating the, the bed, um, uh, end stops? The uh, end stops needs to be done uh -huh. next to the... Uh, needs to be changed to a solid object. To a solid object? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's not solid. Uh, right now it's a mesh thing, so... Uh, I, I don't know. I think it's a, just a... Um, not, not a mesh, it's a... Uh, I forgot the word, but... Uh, yeah. But anyway, it's not... It's not, uh, not ready yet. Not ready, yes. Okay. I don't know, uh, the guy who, who, who is doing that... Uh, if he can maybe right now it's a cell right cell is the word okay uh, uh, so we're talking about cedric yeah. sorry you're talking about cedric uh, it, uh yeah is that the guy who made it uh yeah uh, uh i think so yeah, yeah I, so yeah so if we go to the index here so go to the d3d page if we've got the index um I just yes. didn't want to, to, to talk to him directly. I, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, I filed a bug. Okay. Before. So D3D uh, extruder only. Whoa, that's nice. Uh, how has that been done? That's uh, That's been rendered. Very nice. Uh, I wonder how. Uh, is that FreeCAD render? Or that could be that could be FreeCAD render? Some or is parts it... are FreeCAD and some parts are imported as SSL. But... I will. I try to fix that to a solid. Uh, it took me a little more time than I thought, but I don't know. I can do it, or if the guy who uploaded it he can make it, make it solid. Okay. I don't know. That's okay. Well, that's but that's pretty good though. Um, pretty decent. Uh, there's a little bit of discrepancy there because that that nozzle there that's not that looks like an E3D nozzle. The the one we're using is a just a simple one. So. Yes. Uh, little details there. Should probably change that, but let's 
let's open that up in FreeCAD. So the good thing here is we're using FreeCAD, so it's openly available, um, open format, so anyone can download and work with these. So now we're going to have to convert that. So that's easy, right? Just convert it into, uh, export it as what? As, as STL? No, why can't you work with it? Uh, wait, how is it? Let's look at it as in FreeCAD. Why is it a... Uh, an object that's not it's not FreeCAD native you're saying uh, some parts are FreeCAD and but the nozzle the A3D is is it's, uh, imported shell uh-huh yes it's okay so one of the things we have to pay attention to uh, as this loads up here is making sure that everything is FreeCAD native format as opposed to like mesh or other okay that's that looks pretty nice uh, that looks impressive, uh, but yeah, the nozzle itself we're gonna have to probably modify that. But that's a good that's a good deal. That's good. Looks good. The, our nozzle is much simpler, so actually we have to go. If so, now if we go, okay, how do we know what the deal is? We talked about. So if we go to, okay, let's see. Uh, so I'm recording the screen here, and it's kind of because of those boundaries on the screen, I can't grab the edges now too easily okay so here if we go to um, extruder so d3d so if you go to you know where do you find this work here so it's d3d and then go to the extruder so here the hardware modules d3d extruder so we pointed to the the idea that this is uh, let's see our BOM bill of materials so if we go to the bill of materials on the extruder and that's the mount there uh, the idea was to use this very simple extruder in the bill of materials so click on that and that gets you to one of these very simple off-the-shelf extruders which are uh, low cost and I mean they work but they're not they're not high performance in terms of they can't get you to work with like the high temperature materials because they're not designed for that but they're good as a great first start where we just mount this motor on our carriage as we uh, yeah Yeah, um, so we need to just update that there, and so th that's how the extruder would fit in this carriage, which is mounted on the the X carriage. So that's the idea here. We're using this magnetically connected carriage piece. Okay, so let's see. Let's let's see what we can do in terms of work work breakdown because the idea is for the meeting. Um, if we go to D three D log. So we want to divide tasks and, and see if we have all that we need to keep moving forward. Now, Jose and uh, Cedric are for some reason missing here, so I don't know what, what's happening. But Jean-Baptiste, how are you doing there? Welcome to the team. Hey, welcome. Hey, guys. Yeah, good to have you. And um, I was just wondering, Jean, where your log is, because I know you've got your log, so I was just going to that. If you look at that on a on a screen there, uh, are you gonna continue your same log with uh, for for this team or? I guess it kind of. Um, yeah, this is. You pretty much. You know, maybe what you want, might want to do is. Uh, uh, maybe. Reform, rename your old log to graphics log because you're really about graphics as our graphics lead you, you know right. uh, and maybe just put your log as starting with all this work here uh, on the d3d project so um, that's the idea and by the way uh, I don't know if you know since you're from Chile there's uh, the fab 17 or uh, you know the the fab lab conference is happening in Chile this year I think did you know about no, that? I hadn't seen that? Yeah, I think I think that's what's going on. I was just looking at fab conferences because we got to make our way down to a fab conference sometime in the future. But that's one thing. Okay, but if we go um, just to go to D3D log where we have uh, so D3D page D3D log. Um, let's talk about what we can break down as the main main task. So so right now I'm in the process of building like I wanted to connect the electronics and get that going working at least one axis like probably by tomorrow today or tomorrow today I actually had a bunch of other things to do so I might get to it tomorrow 
but next thing is to start connecting the electronics and the, the probe. What we're missing right now is the software part. Not like it's a big deal because uh, Marlin, the open source software, is well developed, including the ability to do um, height probing. But someone just has to do that, make sure all the configuration is proper and everything else. Um, the idea being for the specific configuration that we have, all the different pulleys and, and size dimensions, all those settings have to be put in to the Marlin software, which we are, uh, that's simply a task that has to be done. But as far as breaking down um, further work, how can we do this? So let's talk about it. Jonathan, um, can you fill us in on anything that's on your side that's relevant? Well, uh, as far as some of the files I found, the STF, STL files on the wiki are not, uh, one's only like 84 kilobytes. So in being able to download the newer files, I think we might have to re-upload them on some of those. Uh, which ones? Are you talking about the print files for the the three? Right. Universal Access stayed the same. The Access Simple, um, that one I think might be okay. I was just on one just now. And Again, it was not allowing for me to print because obviously it wouldn't allow for the load into to Cura to do it. So, um, so are you looking at a D3D page and then integration? Because I think like most of the stuff here, well, no, you need um, you need the individual parts. So, I mean, besides the universal axis, what is there? Um, what else? I mean, really, if Okay. I was you... just on there. Let me find the um, actual file itself. That one was... Yeah, it was the Universal Axis carriage side STL. was only 84 kilobytes. So okay. The Axis, Axis carriage side was only 84 kilobytes, where the previous file was a lot more than that, like 800-something kilobytes. Anyway, it's different. The file is not... It needs to be corrected. But I've okay. got all my parts in, and it's most of my parts in. The only thing I got to work on is my frame. I've got to find someone who can actually cut out cut out my frame. Yeah, right. So and, let's uh, take a look at what's the discrepancy on the files there. Um, so, so you're talking about the universal axis with magnet holes, like you see on my screen. This one here. So carriage, idler, and... Sp if you click on that file, see what it brings. It, I don't want to be up. See if you... Uh... 84 kilobytes? Yeah, see, the one is like 278. I tried loading it up, and it won't load up. The other one won't will load, load up. up. So. Well, um, carriage side... Well, I mean, I maybe, just... maybe it might be my software, but see if you can try to load that into Cura, but I can't. Okay, that's interesting. So, I didn't have any issues with it. So, so let's see. Let's. Um, okay, it might be something with my software, but like I said, I couldn't load it into uh, into Cura to do it to print it out. Okay, let me see. So, if I open Cura, um, I can open up a second one because I'm actually printing out as we speak the extruder mount which has been corrected for the orientation. Um, now I think, um, so Cura, you can open it up through the command line here, get a new window, but that just downloaded here, so Oh, that's interesting. It looks like maybe I'm not getting it either for some reason. Let me try to close down all this stuff. Okay. Well, I guess the only request is just to ask if uh, Emmanuel could actually reload that file. Let me see. Let yeah, me see. I, re I reloaded it. 
Yeah, let me take a look at that because uh, I. It's interesting because I know I've been printing this stuff and uh, it worked for me before. Universal axis carriage side, right? Right here. Yeah, right here. Oh, that's weird. Uh, what's the difference between that one and the last one? Fixed uneven nut hole size. Okay, yeah, if you could just unload it. Maybe I was just playing with the old one. Yeah, okay, good point. Uh, anything else? I know that I will fix up. The, uh, on the, well, I can fix it on the wiki, but some of the, on the DD, D3D page, there's, I guess the link's got to be fixed on there, but that's something minor, but I guess the main thing for me is I'm trying to get the uh, frame, because that's a big part, and then print all the rest of the parts, which I should, was, you know, hoping to be done, but I got the free CAD thing test out of the way, so I accomplished that at least. Very good, So yeah. Yeah, the team is growing. I think we're even up to six if we count you. <laughs> I'm not sure I counted you yet. That's good. Um, very good. So as far as the frame itself, I got a, the cuts. Um, let me share my, my screen with you here. Uh, they were the whole cutting of one set, but which is really three sets, was $150. So let me share my um, just my my video here, show you what that looks like, uh, so everyone can see. Uh, you saw the big frame, and this is like the interior cutout, which is 12 by 12 inches, which would be a still a decent 3D printer. And then there's a baby 3D printer, so those are all nested cutouts. Um, but the idea was to get three three frames out of one uh, for this very small one we could actually probably do it could be usable but since we have six of them we can um, actually put them like next to each other so you could make the the, the small 3d printer is 8 by 16 inches um, which still would get you a printer but we'll, we'll see about it anyway the the set of those three cutouts was 150 bucks from a CNC shop and one of the things we can do as a team, actually, uh, so say we want to take this down to Chile or to Maine or to the Republic of Texas, we should actually get local sourcing quotes. What I would recommend that if you go to, so this is one, you know, if we talk about uh, practicality of replication, that is uh, a significant point. Can people cut out the axes and why metal? Well, metal because... Uh, Uh, if I show you, so if you look at the little 3D printed pieces, they've got these, um, they're magnetically attached. We put little super magnets, which are eight pounds each, and that's a pretty good hold. Like right now, if you look at my um, my screen right there, the, the 3D printer there, um, the axis is holding pretty well. So I think that in itself works quite well, um, but we need a metal frame for that, which is no nobody else is doing that. I don't know of any people who are using steel frames. I know that, for example, Lulzbot is aluminum, and all the other ones are non-frames. They're just kind of like skeletons. So, uh, but we do want to do that. So let's. So I would actually encourage all of us if we could all do that. Uh, so from Chile to everywhere else. I mean, basically the local. So well, okay. Let's let's back up a little bit. Why? Okay, because we want to make this. Um, in the back of my mind is a goal that says D3D is the distributive enterprise 3d printer distributive meaning is we make it easy for anyone in the world to do this so this becomes an amazing uh, product that more people get involved in because the barriers to entry are so low part of that is getting the localized part sourcing like we can get the 3d prints pretty easily by a 3d printer we can get those nuts and bolts and and rods easily and electronics they're all widely accessible everywhere but a thing that isn't is the frame. That's local custom cut. So um, if we could get all of you to, to, to actually do that. Um, so for example, Jean-Baptiste, if you can uh, find out about that for, for Santiago, who's, who cuts metal, give yeah, him the file. Right. So, I was wondering about the metal. Yeah. Do we have the, in the bill of materials, is that specified like the thickness and stuff like that? It is. So let's go to the 
Uh, if you go to D3D page, go to frame. Uh, so we go to D3D frame and the file is right there. So you can give that exact file to do exactly what we did here. Um, the first step would be a quote for what that single thing would cost. So that's in America we have four by eight foot sheets, um, four feet by eight feet. Let me see if are you guys are you guys not seeing it here. Let me sh share my screen again. Um, in America we're four by eight feet and we've got this frame. Ah. Okay, there it is. Nested three sets of frames, which is a really good way to go with lower waste of material. But when you think about it, the advantage here is this is one unique part count for the frame. That's a world record. One unique part count, that's good. Uh, that means you simplify this to the point that you can then begin to imagine the lar large builds where there's hundreds of people building these in principle. I think we can match so, Tony, so Tony how many Rout. Can you cut out of that? <laughs> Say it again. How many cuts can you get out of that 4x8 sheet? Well, 4 by 8 sheet is exactly what you're seeing here. So out of 4 by 8 you can get one complete set like that, but if you get a complete sheet, you get three sets of three. So nine frames out of one sheet. Now this cost me right now 150 is there any waste to that? Well, I mean the inner cutouts. But the inner cutouts could probably be used for like the mounting for like the controller or something. Or if you actually put them together, uh, six of them, I mean, you can make a tiny little 3D printer out of them too if you want, if you're, you know, if you're crazy, if you shrink down the axis even, even more. Or actually, see, the thing about the magnetic frame, you can attach the axis not on the inside of the frame, but on the outside of the frame. So even with a tiny frame, if you attach the axis on the outside and therefore you buy yourself more space, you can have a tiny 3D printer like that too. And we can possibly talk about shrinking the parts even more. But the downloads are here. Um, let's see what else is relevant on this page here. So here's an example of the magnetic mounting. Uh, this is all, I mean, this is back from Facebook on the OSC Workshops Facebook page. But right here, for example, you see the connection is strong. Like by just holding onto those magnets, I was able to pick up the entire metal, which is seven pounds. Not too heavy, but considerable uh, you can pick up the entire metal by just picking up the through the magnetic connection by picking up the metal piece the the 3d printed piece so what we can do here let's start a section here for local sourcing this could be a crowd challenge for everyone watching this video for anyone watching this video take this file and email that to a local CNC metal shop meaning a metal shop that has a CNC plasma or torch table, CNC torch table, meaning that they can cut that out from thin steel. So the idea is in America, we used 11 gauge. Actually, this, what I have right here is 10 gauge, which is 0.13 inch. Uh, for metric sizes, I'm not sure what's the standard size of a sheet, but um, three millimeter would be about the right that's about one eighth inch this is nominally one eighth of an inch so and here's your cut request template please provide a quote and turnaround time for CNC cutting of the attached file cut from four by eight sheet 11 gauge I need six of those nested sets as shown in the file which take a total of 32 inches long of a 96 inch long sheet um, more notes on this on the wiki so you can send them a link to the wiki and here's the download of all the files and here's the notes on it the outer square is 16 inch outer uh, size the middle is 12 inches outer size so that's no problem to make little 3d printers out of that for the 8 inch if we do do that we probably have to mount the axis on the outside but that's that's the idea if you if you get this I mean it's gonna cost you some money and if you don't have it then you don't have it but um, this is definitely worth pursuing because then 
Um, okay, if it was $150, so let's go through the math here. The actual metal cost, steel is a dollar a pound, and one of these entire sheets costs $160. All right? And the setup fee for cutting, so it's $160, and the cutting fee for this job right here was about $70. Now, most of the cut time goes to loading up the file, putting on the piece of metal, and so forth. So I don't imagine the price for the entire sheet being much more than $70. I'm estimating probably uh, $100 or even $70. I mean, because it really, once you have everything set up, the CNC cutting is a smaller part of the deal. So let's say 100 bucks for that, 160 for the metal itself. You're talking about about $250 or so, or a little more. But if you're getting nine sets of frames, or at least uh, six if you use the outer and middle, so say 300 divided by six is 50 bucks a frame. So not super cheap, but very, very competitive for what you get. I mean, after you put these together, they are very strong. And... Uh, the concept right now of how you put them together and this is what I've done on this one here uh, what right. is the weight what is the weight uh, of, of the total frame or at least the parts you've got so far like what you've got built how much you estimate that that weighs uh, my 3d printer there is um, entire sheet is a hundred sixty pounds divided by each of them are about equal divide 160 by 9 or 10 it's about 15 or 20 pounds per frame so it's pretty solid pretty it's 17.7 gotcha okay. yeah about say it's 17 pounds now that's gauge 10 it'll be like 15 pounds if it's gauge 12 but about 15 pounds or so um, so that's the idea there. So, dear world, please do this, and we can document this here, so we can edit here, so local sourcing results, like we should put like a map here, and put, or like a spreadsheet or something, uh, so basically we should say cost estimates for other countries, cost estimates for, uh, other locations so we can just say say Chile um, there's Maine Texas um, USA Missouri which I did that from it's the place is called Seaman and Shusky St. Joseph Missouri job cost $150 even for cutting of of the nested set above so $150 is what that is and once we have the CNC torch table this is one we're, why we're going metal it's also easy to cut with our own CNC torch table once we have it, and that means you're paying 160 uh, for the set of, of say nine frames. So it's under 20 bucks per frame once you have the CNC torch table, which is very reasonable. Uh, I'm actually not sure what the Folgertech Prusa, the the aluminum extrusions are, but I don't think they're actually any cheaper. They're about two dollars, or I think maybe two or four dollars a foot, if I remember. If it's two dollars a foot, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. It's it's about twenty dollars for the Folger Tech Prusa that which we did last year. So it's not any cheaper if you use the aluminum, and the solid cubic frame gets you an incredible strength. And the way to build that is you put the bottom piece on and the four sides, hold them together, put a piece of five-minute epoxy dribble five-minute epoxy upon the top corner 
and that's it and let it fall down the edge as far as it gets to and that gets you a lot of coverage it's basically five minute epoxy which is 3000 psi strong um, that's how I did this one and I think we can do it without bolting uh, I was kind of thinking well can you do it with bolting without it because bolting is the easy way to do it you just bolt it but if you hold it using a little clamp or a magnetic angle uh, in the upright position just hold the thing together put a drop of epoxy on each top corner the epoxy drifts down by gravity down the corner which is a perfect 90 degree corner because it's CNC cut it's very precise and that could be it so in a few minutes so you basically you you do that uh, you let the epoxy dry as you move on to other steps during a build and then you've got the finished frame relatively easy for me it was hard because the epoxy I used I had to smear it across all the cracks uh, I didn't think about the idea of letting the gravity do it I can say that doing it by hand and uh, having to smear all the cracks that takes an hour of time which might be acceptable but mm, it's kind of finicky because if you bump it by mistake and you you know say say you can of course count on that happening during a workshop if you mess up a frame during during the build time it could be in some cases a real mess and hard to recover because you got partially dried epoxy and it's all messy and stuff but I think the single drop on the upper corner plus gravity that might be the way to go so I'm gonna do that again I'm gonna get me another well at least build the interior set using that technique I got some five minute epoxy so we'll see if that works but anyway to sum up this thing anyone who's watching it and people on a team please reach out with this request template cut request template reach out to wherever you are in the world so so this applies to our German collaborators I'm gonna pass this on to them and network with them to make sure that they they have a good reliable source in Hamburg Germany but this should be accessible throughout the world wherever there's access to CNC torch tables uh, so industrialized world yes developing world not really uh, but in a developing world you can even cut this out by hand if you have access to that steel so there's different ways to do it now for us you want to have the reliable CNC cut because if you do that you can talk about the idea of building a hundred of these in a single day as a reality not something that's far-fetched it makes me think of Tony Robbins having a whole stadium of his participants I think we should do that what do you think guys have a big event and use the entire football field or a stadium and have like a thousand made in a single day I would like that so let's see if we can do that a little later but basically if you talk about an, a notion of something like that that's a huge logistical nightmare unless you're thinking very carefully about the modularity aspects and everything here like the frame being one unique part count plus a tube of epoxy that's doable at that point so things like that and then as you see on the frame itself we've got the the same identical uh, axis element on the XYZ axis so absolute redundancy of parts so so making it very easy to do okay any questions on this part can you guys do that and get yeah, estimates? What's, uh, what's the turnaround time on your machine shop my turnaround time was I, I emailed them on on Monday night and I had the cut in my hands on Friday they delivered to me so um, that was great uh, for a very simple job like that it only should take a couple of days if they're not busy they can do it the same day or whatever depends on how busy your CNC shop is uh, so can you guys do that Jean can you do that for Chile do, would you have all the info you need yeah I can that would be great yeah, yeah. excellent and Emmanuel can you do that for for Bangor Maine yeah I already found the only company in Maine that has a CNC Plasma. Only company in Maine? Yes. Oh, there's got to be more than one company in Maine that has CNC torch tables. It, it, uh, for plasma, it's only one. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like a great opportunity. 
Well, if this could be so just to make another note here, this could be plasma. Okay, let's 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 get uh so this is just just to make another note. You can use can use oxyacetylene plasma um, laser or water jet. Those are all widely accessible technologies. Like oxy fuel, which is oxyacetylene, could be oxyhydrogen, whatever. Oxy fuel, plasma, laser, or water jet. So I'm sure there's more than one, definitely more than one in Maine. I mean, this is very common industrial technology unless Maine is really an agrarian age or something. But no, I, everyone's got that in the United States. Um, so, yeah. And besides that, let's let's go back to so let's do that, guys. And then um, and anyone else who's watching it. So if you watch this, contribute to the project. That would help because we're trying to spread this all over the world, make this the most widely replicated thing in the world. If it works, I mean, the idea is we're, we want to make it easy for everybody. If this thing is working, and there's no evidence that says it wouldn't work. Uh, so far, the, what we have done is great. The axes are working excellent. The idea that you can have the same axis for all the axes, that's a great idea, and so forth. So let's go now to D3D and let's talk about work breakdown for all of us here, so what we can commit to. So what are some of the things? I, for me, I've got my hands busy on putting the electronics on and running the thing. Um, so D3, let's go to D3D log. How do we break this down? <clears throat> uh, Emmanuel, how much time do you have left on the CAD integration work? Um, it's not, it, it's details, I don't know how much time, uh, mm -hmm. so depends, do you want to put the belts? Yeah, it's yeah, we want to put the whole thing together such that we can go from, like if we make a, an instructional video or a promotional video, we can get a nice render and a nice uh, exploded part animation and things like that so for that you want to be as complete as possible so do I would say uh, do one possibly do two versions with where one is like the simplified version and the second one like maybe you don't have all the bolts in there because it might be really slow to manipulate and the other one is the complete with all the details so it's like fully technically correct and everything that, uh, but but since we're still testing how capable FreeCAD is to to do that, like because the idea is that it might slow down so much it's just really painful to work with. So keep the two routes open, but definitely get as much of a complete, perfected model that's good for publicity reasons, not only for real build instructionals, but also for publicity, like rendering that in Blender, for example, or in I Blender modifying that so you can show how you can like scale this extend this on one axis or another axis that could be a graphics project you know at that point once we have the CAD file we can get a blender person so we should recruit for some blender people to the team uh, but then they can manipulate it like make animations or make modifications in blender once they have the technically correct base they can really manipulate in all kinds of ways to get really fanciful uh, PR material so that would be that would be really good um, like for example if you watch um, the Prusa i3 which is the open source the original they have a very nice promotional video where they show how the entire printer works it's kind of a flyby in within the graphics it's a virtual flyby of the entire machine so that kind of stuff is that's something to that effect is what we want to get uh, once we have the complete model. So the complete model is important. Um, and also possibly like the color scheme. Uh, how's the color scheme? Maybe kind of looks weird right now. Maybe make it more um, more realistic, like maybe bluish or black, because we're going to have it probably paint the frame black as the black beauty. Um, maybe differentiate the rods uh, to be metallic color and so forth, because right now... Um, the aesthetics are a little not there. We should make it, uh, or maybe we can give it to somebody else to finish up. Maybe you do the technical. At the end of the day, we can get a graphics guy like Jean-Baptiste to, to make it pretty. 
Uh, and actually another thing to do, which would be a, a big, big priority, is to do a, an infographic on that. Um, yeah, I was just looking at the development spreadsheet and there's a blank spot right next to the infographic. So yeah, I was thinking about getting started on that. Too. Absolutely. So that would be a perfect task. I mean, since we're pretty decent on the technical front here, I think uh, given your skill set right now, I think we could definitely use that. Um, so Emmanuel, we're going to have finish frame int frame CAD plus integration. Um, okay, so Richard, who's not on here, but we should be looking for a blender guy, recruiting a blender guy. Find, recruit a blender person because we could really use some help on that. Um, or maybe uh, we know Cedric, maybe Cedric. Uh, could do that so let's put Cedric um, to render it or once the complete some co collaborate with Emmanuel but once the complete frame is there once again Emmanuel on your log to make it easy for everyone just upload yeah on a running basis don't you know as soon as you're done for the day upload that thing so that uh, that would be important for the the blender guy like say you guys are working together uh, then you can you know the blender guy could get started as soon as possible with the rough sketch and then they can you know keep updating the file but as long as they get the workflow down it'll be a good thing um it's so everything's uploaded right away yep yep that's yeah. great so um so infographic yeah that would be good and for that we should basically uh start with the uh, on the internet we've got you know you, you should what you should do is start by going through all the information that we have um, um, and then especially like the parts breakdown and kind of uh, talk about the main features uh, so like for example the frame uh, one part count frame there's there's magnetic attachment. Uh, the the tool head is magnetically attached. Uh, that's a cool feature. I mean, completely modular design, uh, modular, scalable as normal. The wiring system. If you look at the controller, I mean, we're going to this radical Cat5 wire, the Ethernet wire for all the wiring to make it and an quick connect plugs so it's really easy to connect like you can connect it in five minutes as opposed to 50 minutes for the entire controller um, so cat5 wiring uh, what else is unusual about this I mean the whole thing is designed for minimum parts count while being high performance uh, by high performance the big thing that we have here is the the bed does not move um, the Prusa and the Lulzbot, both of those, the bed moves. That is not good if you talk about printing lo large, tall, tall, thin structures. Because when the bed moves, you shake the structure and it gets jagged edges and it just fails towards the top. So we have the XY, all the motion, up in a gantry. Uh, so it means no moving bed. The moving bed is not good design for high performance. Um, the Ultimaker is the only one that really gets that one right. And actually, actually, uh, MakerBot, the evil MakerBot, actually, they, they got that right because they don't have a moving bed either. Um, but most of the 3D printers right now have moving beds, which is not a good design once you want to get... Like a lot of stuff we print is going to be tall stuff, like fence posts, plumbing for houses. Those are going to be printed vertically. We need the vertical capacity. Uh, and then enclosable structure. Uh, because we have a whole cubic frame, uh, you can close it so it's so it's warm inside. And therefore, the, it comes down to energy use because if you're saving that heat, you're going to end up uh, being much more cost effective because the, the concept is right now it costs 50 cents per pound of print in electricity costs. I think that with a close, that's, um, 
I did that and actually calculated that recently. Uh, or you can read the paper by Joshua Pierce about that. It. It's about 50 cents a pound of print. That's a lot of cost for heavy prints. Like if you want to print out a fence post that's three pounds, that would cost you a dollar fifty. If you want to print out a two by four plastic piece of lumber that's ten pounds, it would cost you five dollars in electricity. That's a lot. So we want to reduce that. I would say the enclosure probably gets you down to as good as 25% of the energy. So you're talking about huge savings once you can enclose the print so that you're saving electricity because you don't have to constantly heat the bed and heat the extruder as much. So um, so that's those are some of the features. Uh, and then we, we should probably go through, once you study it, like kind of look at the things like see what's what's cool to you but I think the I mean the main thing is the construction set approach um, and I don't know how much you've heard about the idea that the same structure can be used the same design principles to 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 do much larger axes or frames where the there's one inch rods or even two inch rods so currently we're using eight millimeter rods which is five sixteenths of an inch tiny but you can scale them up one inch to to a router or a CNC torch table two inch for heavy duty machines so that's actually on the plan a few months from now the exact same technique that we're doing all we're doing is we're printing larger parts and putting much heavier rods and using larger steppers and instead of steppers hydraulic motors talking about heavy duty serious business making engines and things like that so the construction set approach is huge for anyone who can appreciate it um, and once again designing it for social build uh, social production extreme manufacturing um, um, I'd like to personally I'd like to see a stadium stadium scale build if you haven't thought about that yet you heard it first here okay uh, but that's a natural evolution if you think about extreme manufacturing why not because that shows that you can rival centralized production in terms of the volumes of manufacturing while using a totally different model okay um, so we've got a few people missing on a team that, let's see, um, we need to dole, dole out things to. Jonathan, anything on your side? As far as, uh, no, I mean, for me, I'm putting out my part, rest of my parts, getting the frame in, in there, and then uh, ordering uh, the extruder. What extruder exactly are we, we yeah. uh, for sure on? Yeah, I mean, we're just using the D3D extruder that's in the bill of materials, which is right there. I just used a simple one as we did last time which is if you go to BOM on D3D Extruder uh, it's just a simple one this this regular MK8 deal that's easily accessible it, the, the, the motor mounts in that little motor bracket that we have simple good enough for now it works um, it just can't do the high temperature plastics like polycarbonate or rubber so that's that. Um, so now we're on the, uh, the 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 DXF files. Do you send uh, do you send both of them or just one of them to your to the CNC people? Because I saw there's two different files there. Let's see which ones are those. Layout. Layout, and then there's the nested ones. I don't know if you got to send them both or they just require just the the. the, the top send them there. both. I don't know. It depends what they want, but they probably want just the bottom one. The top one is for reference because it's got the dimensions in there. The bottom one just has a nested piece. That's it. Okay. Um, and, uh, yeah, what do you guys think about the bolts versus epoxy? You think epoxy is doable in a workshop scenario? Well, when you're epo the epoxy, you're talking about just the corners to put the frame together, correct? No, because you drip it, drip it on the corner, but it drip drips down and covers goes all the way down. You put a big glob on the corner and just drifts down, covering the edge. So that's what I was thinking. Um, well, no, no, I guess. The, I mean, the question is that you want to 
make it permanent, correct? Yeah. Yeah, the frame can be permanent. I mean, you can grind it with a grinder, but yeah, you want it. Um, I mean, the, the disadvantage is that if you want to flatten it up for shipping, uh, you got to cut up cut up the frame. So that's why I was saying if you're going to request like brick, uh, bolts or versus epoxy, I mean, I guess it depends on if a person wants to ship it or if it's going to be well, a actually, portable machine or a static machine. Okay, so you got a good point there because if somebody, say, somebody goes to the the workshop and they got to ship it back because they're traveling, I know there's a couple of people that supported the Kickstarter. They're, they're coming in from other countries like Turkey, actually. Um, yeah, that might be an issue. So maybe what we want to do on this is... Uh, get the bolt uh, the bolt holes in there too just as an option so people could either bolt it yeah that's actually pretty good um yeah yeah so probably what we want to do is up update this file and put little bolts we have to specify very carefully which kind of brackets we want to use like get them from a master car or something easily sourceable well, place yeah just a quick question is it possible to take like an uh a 90 degree angle like an angle iron that goes on both sides using magnets on both sides you can you can you have to use it would work um, it would it would you just need a bunch of magnets like you probably need like I would use six if you're using the whole 14 inch frame 12 per angle so six and six yeah. now 12 cost you they're like uh, they're like 20 cents so it'll be two dollars and forty cents per corner, and there's two, four, eight, ten, twelve corners. Twelve corners times two bucks, so it'll be another twenty-four bucks added to the frame. You're doubling the frame cost, but it's doable that way. And uh, I've tested that; it works. It works pretty well. I mean, that once you get so many magnets on that edge there, it's pretty solid. Um, but it won't look as you know as clean would be just a little more messy it's it's doable uh, but we have to make some decisions on how to do it I think it's kinda I don't know um, the practice of it is you need a bunch of bunch of those magnets it takes a little bit of time to do that not not too much it's probably a half an hour job it, it makes it the frame more like an hour job half an hour to an hour job because those magnets are really strong and uh, they kinda tend to it's kind of like your fingers are going to get tired kind of deal right because there's so many of them uh, it's Did a doable both, option both inside and outside or just in, on the outside um, just one or the other would work because they're very strong if you put them on the inside you're actually taking up space from mounting the the axes so you want to put them on the outside okay. where they are right now um, but maybe right that's a that's a good point um but if you're using 12 per corner times 12 you're talking about man that the numbers there get quite big so just to handle that like you're talking about 12 times 12 is 144 that's like a whole yeah we're take a bit of time count. that's what we're trying to avoid take a, yeah. takes a bit of time um i would say for people who want to take the frame apart I do think the 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 little angles are a good idea because why I shifted from the bolting is that bolt holes in CNC cutting are actually expensive like we were first mounting the axes with bolts so we put all these holes in the in the metal uh, because piercing is a hard part in in metal cutting so they charge you more for that typically so I was trying to avoid that but just to have like you're talking about eight holes per piece so you got two on each side and there's six pieces so it's 48 holes um, it's probably gonna add another twelve dollars to the cost of the frame that's not bad but I think, I think like, idea is a great idea I mean it's a pretty you like it? idea to be able to take it apart put it together or at least assembly is a lot easier no so. I mean it's it's uh, so I guess you you really like that idea because of also the modularity thing? Yeah, I mean the the magnets are an amazing idea because they one are. assembly is and then deassembly. I mean yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I think that's yeah. really to, to get on a larger scale and you got a bunch of people. Right, you know. right. Um, yeah, yeah. 
Well, I guess I would have to get more magnets because I only got like 130 magnets here. I wasn't really thinking about that, but it's it's doable. Uh, at the little bit of extra expense, expense of like 24 bucks, not too bad. Um, I mean, it's quite acceptable, but if you want, you know, if you're really, really trying to go for low cost, you can do it otherwise. So you might have different options. So question would be, do we support all three options as acceptable? So maybe what we should do is, yeah, maybe... Uh, I do think that there's a big attraction, like people are kind of like psychologically speaking, people when they see magnets, they're like, yeah, cool, you know, like magic magnets. So there's also this psychological effect of the, the flexibility. It is true. But if you talk about simple build, uh, my estimation would be that in terms of the time and effort it takes, I would say it's the the epoxy followed by the the eight brackets per side followed by the magnets in terms of the amount of time it takes so it's, it would be like 15 minutes 30 minutes an hour now an how hour long, so how long does it take to set you said about an hour uh depends what like epoxy you get but there's epoxy that becomes workable within 20 minutes uh, or even true. there's st some that are setting Five within minutes. one minute yeah like like really quick but the one minute, the five, which is called like instant, like the five minute, I mean, that really wouldn't get you. You have to mix it a couple of times. So so the quick stuff, which sets in 20 minutes, that would get you enough time to glob it on all the corners. You know, what, what this boils down to is we should try all the options and say, okay, this works like this, because I kind of chose one over the other. But um, I think we should try all of them. So I, I would say when you get your cuts... Um, First, I would say maybe wait for the, you know, the epoxy route is definitely workable. So we, you can get a quote right now. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to get another quote for the one with the holes. Because I, I, I do want to explore the, the route of just doing the angle brackets uh, that are bolted. But it's not going to look as clean or anything like that. It's going to, you know, right now the frame looks really, really neat and professional. Uh, once you start adding bolts to it, it starts looking lar like our Frankenstein work. That's usual of OSE, right. <laughs> which is not bad, but uh, it does. What about even tack welding it? I mean, you can, but that leaves for a, you know that's a totally different operation. So, like if you do it, you can't do it in a cafeteria. You, then you need an industrial right. space. So, well, they have uh, they have spot welders that are pretty cheap. They're like Harbor Freight spot welders that have. You, um, you can actually put it to the corners of the edge. and just, Oh, you can you do can corners with that? I believe you can. I mean, it's a little L bracket that puts over it. You could probably do... Oh, interesting. I didn't think about that. Okay. Yeah, I'll see if I can find it real quick. One second. Now, that would be interesting because if you don't have... So, for sp for welding, the thing that... Why you can't do it in an auditorium is because it has spatter and it you know, could catch on fire. But spot welding is clean. It doesn't... Um, it's a different machine we could oh wow interesting um yeah we can I, I would say we go actively to find out what the deal with spot welding is um yeah because that would be i mean if you talk about speed that's probably going to be the fastest like snap 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 yeah it's probably going to be faster have to think about that but anyway, I think we could still get the get the estimates because I do believe the one valid way to do it is the epoxy. Like my version here is epoxy. I think it's great. Um, but we should also explore as forks of this and kind of decide on which we want to actually support as the official recommended versions. And of course, anyone's free to do whatever they want. But uh, we should know solid data on okay, what how much time does it take to do each route. Um, that's the kind of stuff we want to provide. Some solid data on that. Okay, um, sounds good. Uh, so what else? Um, we've got Jose Ura. He didn't make the meeting here. Um, okay, but that sounds like um, I think we've got plenty to do for each of us. Um, whoever has not did the time done the timesheet please do that 
Uh, Cedric, I know, hasn't done that. So please fill in the timesheet because the idea on the timesheet is I'm not making any numbers up if it's not in recorded. Um, that's the data that goes on the graph because we can't pull information out of thin air. So that graph is an accurate graph of the hours logged on the timesheet. Uh, that's the only thing. Otherwise, to wrap up here, so Emmanuel, finish up the CAD. Richard, uh, I'm meeting with Richard tomorrow, so we have the, the HR, human resources stuff, meeting tomorrow at 1 p.m. Cedric, we'll have to check in with him. John, do you need anything um, else? You think you you can start on an infographic, or, or we should probably talk about more the... Uh, wording yeah yep that's that's good too uh, so source frame for everyone that's on everyone's plate uh, as far as the infographic uh, what do we need to do on that to go for forward Yeah, yeah. Log would be the best, and then then feel free to add that to the main D3D page, just D3D. But yeah, log is the first place. Uh huh. Uh, I might help on an infographic text, and then do the electronics. We really need somebody on electronics, uh, not not electronics, but the code, because for now we can use the standard off the shelf. Um, Marlin code but if we want to do custom calibration procedures which make it automatic calibration like fully there's ways you can we need to do some programming on that so anyone who's listening who's a programmer join the team here uh, right now we would have the capacity to do automatic bed leveling using off-the-shelf code but you have to still calibrate it like once um, using a procedure that takes a little bit of time we can automate that procedure if we do some custom coding so that's the invitation for the electronics or the the control code um, so that's that um, let's see Emmanuel you have everything you need to get get going take care of his goat and there's the man okay I think he's got what he needs um, and Jonathan whatever you find on that if you assess that the spot welders please add that to to your log or to to the d3d page on the frame that would help yeah we should we should consider that because if that's a clean route to do it um, it could be a, a good even as a backup or something you know you know or even if you spot weld it in one place and then you just dribble the epoxy as the way to get it down the whole edge and stuff. We'll, we'll see, but that's definitely a live thing. Because as far as the schedule goes, we got to do the announcement. The latest, latest is the 20th. So that means exactly two weeks from now, the announcement is out. So this week is getting the machine running and taking some initial video. Uh, getting infographics and things next week is is like do the video the promo video and then publish that by the 20th so finish up this week um, publicity work next week and we're publishing that on the 20th so for anyone's listening otherwise show up in Hamburg Germany we're posting that on Eventbrite on the 20th by the 20th which gives us one month and two days before the event and I gotta get some tickets to get make get myself out there and so forth and look forward to all the Kickstarter meeting the Kickstarter supporters there's three of them that are coming to that workshop so and then the people from Hamburg they're um, they're interested in supporting this work they're the people from Open Labs the guys who invited me to Hamburg before 
Um, but that's pretty good. So I think we've got everything for now. And the people who haven't been at this meeting, uh, we can follow up and just email us after you watch this video, and I'll post it up right now. Uh, anything else we got to cover? I think we're pretty good for now. So if any questions arise, let us know. We'll continue these meetings, keep building the team, and moving forward. So thanks a lot, and we'll see you soon.